it's been awesome to see. Um, the Marlies made a playoff run, I, I want to say, while you were still in Vancouver um, in 2008, and there wasn't as much talk, and, and the young players didn't seem as exciting to people, and people didn't go. But it's been great attendance the last two games out. It was last round two. It's uh, it's rewarding for these these players uh, who kind of obviously don't get the spotlight in a, in a big city when the NHL clubs as big as the Leafs are in the same city. And uh, it's been great for them that the spotlight's been pushed on them the last few weeks. Oh, it has. You know, I think a lot of people deserve some credit. First and foremost, the players, but uh, the coaching staff as well. Dallas is, and his staff have done a great job all year you know, getting those guys ready. You, you mentioned last time the Marlies had a bit of a run, uh, and I agree with you. It's, it's a little different this time in that uh, that team had a lot of veterans. You're always, you know, always going to need some veterans at the American League level to have some success. But um, you know, this time we were mixing it in with some younger players, which is, uh, you know, it's been very gratifying for I think all of, all the players and the, the staff involved. Obviously, Dave, you have a handle on the on the skill set of all the players with the Marlies because you have played a big part in hand picking the team. But when you look at how they performed in the playoffs, has your perception certain players changed because they've played so well? Well, a little bit. I mean, it's you always want to have your younger players have a playoff run. It, it it shows what they have. It shows how hard they're prepared to to work and, and sacrifices they're prepared to make. And you know, some players that don't normally stand out or get talked about of you know, have definitely jumped forward. And you know, the players like Jerry D'Amigo has had an excellent playoff. Uh, you know, Scotty's been excellent. You know, he, there's been a lot of unsung heroes throughout the course of the playoffs, but. When you get to to the third round, and hopefully beyond that, you start to see what um, you know what these guys are prepared to do in order to make it. Dave Nonis, our guest on Brady Lane, the guys that played the most for the big club uh, this past year were obviously Matt Fradden and Jake Gardner on the Marlies. Were you ever worried about a transition in terms of going back? All all the minutes, a lot more, you know, a lot a lot more travel, obviously for these guys and, and just a higher intensity and higher caliber of hockey. And, and sometimes guys don't make a team out of camp and it takes them a while to get going when they're younger players. Were you worried at all about how they'd readjust to, uh, to the AHL? Cause they've both been very good. No, not really. You know, I think that um, you, you want to make sure you have the right person who's got the right mindset. And both those guys were, you know, they were prepared to go down and, and participate. They understood that, yes, they played most of the year up, but they, weren't regular NHLers. Yeah, you, you know, maybe you could say that Jake has put himself in that position, but Fratz was a guy that was up and up and down, and, and um, there's no, no shame or harm in going and playing in the American Hockey League. I think once they both got down and they realized, again, how intense the playoffs were going to be and that it's going to be a great learning experience for both of them, uh, you know, they've both jumped in with both feet, and, and I think it's been, uh, it's been excellent for them. Dave, has Ben Scribbins' performance at all whatsoever changed your mindset going into the offseason about the game plan for whether or not you acquire a veteran goalie for next year? No, not really. You know, I think uh, you know Ben's playing excellent, and he's performed at a higher level than we had anticipated at this point in his career. When you look at the, you know the fact he hasn't been a pro for very long, but um, it's a lot to ask for a guy like that to jump in and possibly be a you know, a 40 game guy, which, you know, which might have to happen. You don't know what's going to happen with injuries. So if you put a player like that uh, on your team, you, you, you need to, to know that he's going to be able to play 40, 45 games. And with Ben, you know, he'll have every opportunity to come make, make our team like everyone else. But, you know, we want to make sure we have enough depth and goal. And that wouldn't change our position in terms of going after a veteran. So if I read the tea, the tea leaves opening night, you'd say it'd be, it'd be, unusual, unlikely that Ben Scrivens and James Reimer are the two goalies dressed that it, it almost, it, it almost sort of pits Scrivens and Reimer in, in a battle for a roster spot. Doesn't it? Well, yes. I mean, I think that you're, you, you would never say never because players have to have the opportunity to come earn a spot on a team. Again, and we never thought that Jake Gardner was going to come and play for us this yeah. year, at least the number of games, but he, he made it impossible for us to send him down. Is that a, a scenario that could happen with Ben? No question. And, uh, uh, you know, he's going to come to camp next year with a, a great run under his belt, playoff hockey under his belt, hopefully a championship under his belt, and then he can come try to make our club, and he'd, he'd be in a much better position to do so. But from a Leaf standpoint, we need to make sure that we backfill and have some depth there so that we have, you know, some quality goaltenders to pick from. Dave, we're just under a month away from the NHL entry draft. How set are you and your scouting staff 
on where you're going in the first round? Are you going to wait for the combine next week and any possibilities of trading up before you get a real, say, top three in your heads where you want to go? Well, our, our staff's narrowed it, narrowed the list down fairly tight. Um, you know, the combine will affect it a little bit. You know, the, the interview process, uh, the testing, uh, and then again at the draft when you can sit down and, and bring them in for even a little longer. So there's some tweaking to do, but the grouping is is fairly tight right now. And um, you know, there'll be some guys that maybe move one or two spots uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, but overall, we're you know we, we've got the, the players maybe not exactly in order, but pretty close and we'll we'll uh we'll tighten that up as we get right before the draft they've known as our guest on brady lang on sportsnet 590 the fan you spend time at the world's obviously putting together the team with uh with kevin lowe pete Chirelli. kevin lowe brought ryan murray uh and and he played in the tournament would would the oilers trading out of the number one spot really make the top five a lot more wide open if they take murray they take murray and it, it leaves a glut of, of pretty talented forwards from two to five but if they trade out it's sort of open season and and you guys don't know where the cards may fall well i don't think anyone knows where the cards are going to fall this is a draft where i think um again i think the, most teams are going to have the same top 10 or top 15 but they're they're not going to be anywhere near the same order there's a lot of different uh pieces different personalities um you know i, I think it's going to be a, a draft where you know we you might have a guy ranked third or fourth, and he ends up going eight or nine or ten. Um, and I think the most teams would would, uh, would tell you the same thing. There's some very good players in this draft, but it's not a draft that a lot of them have really jumped ahead. Um, and there's also, you know, a, a, the, the positional aspect of it. There's a lot of defensemen that are they're different. You know, it depends what you're looking for. There's some high-end offensive defensemen in this draft. There's a couple of shutdown guys. Um, you know, you talk about Ryan Murray, who's mm-hmm. probably the steadiest of the whole group. So I, it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens prior to the draft in terms of moving picks, and then once the draft starts, I think there'll be a lot of surprises. Because it's in the public domain, uh, the, the scenario with Rick Dudley, I'll, I'll, I'll phrase as hypothetical: if Rick Dudley isn't with your staff, forget the draft, but heading into next season, would you hire another person? Would would uh, responsibilities be delegated differently with Claude Loisel, with Dave Poulin? Um, there's obviously a contingency plan given, you know, you're dealing with this uh, as it is currently. Yes. I mean, having, having Rick on the staff uh, was, you know, it wasn't something we actually originally planned on. It, it kind of fell in our lap because of his situation when, it, when you know, leaving Atlanta, uh, he was available. When you have a guy like that that's available, whether it's for a year or two, um, you, you try to take advantage of it. So, yes, I mean, there, there may be some shuffling of duties, uh, refocusing of, of certain, um, certain people on the pro side in particular, um, you know, if, if that's something that occurs. But it's, it's not uh, insurmountable. It's not something that we would ha- have a difficult time in terms of reallocation. Dave, if the Leafs are going to add some pieces in the offseason uh, to the big club, a veteran player, what's a more likely scenario via the trade or UFAs? I would say a more likely scenario would be via trade. The Uf, UFA market, um, you know, there's some pieces there that that might be able to help. Um, and you know, you generally, um, you you don't want to build your team with with UFAs, and and not because it's not good players there. It's just because you're going to spend more generally uh, for those players than I wouldn't say what they're worth, but what you have to if you if you're acquiring player under contract and. Um, you know, for us, yes, we'll look at it. We probably will jump in for a couple of pieces, um, but overall, we're going to approach uh, the, the trade market as a, a primary source of improvement. Dave, known as our guest. Before you go, I, I mean, I, I think this summer is a tough summer to envy being an NHL executive. Uh, you guys have worked hard to get where you are. It's uh, th- there's a lot of perks, but this is tough with the CBA being where it's at. Do you have to to sort of have one plan? for uh, the existing CBA, and do you have to have another in, in case things get altered with the cap, with being able to, to amnesty contracts, that kind of thing? Well, I think you'd be mindful of what may, may happen going forward, but you have to operate with the rules that you're given, and the current CBA is still in effect um, come July 1st and throughout the summer. You know, so, you know, again, you don't think you're doing anything stupid, but uh, you want to make sure that 